I said that uh, one of the tendencies of my talks is to, each time I come to a new piece of the jigsaw, I say, ah, but this, this part is really the most important part. So I will say that again. This is the most important part of this jigsaw, law. Um, the English legal system, uh, most of you won't know much about it, as, and I'll only be able to explain a little bit, but you can read more about it when the book comes out, um, is crucial to modernity as we conceive of it in the West. And it has spread all over the world. Most legal systems now are partly based on English law. Um, because if you remember the original diagram where you have the modernity is defined as the four separate politics, economics, society, religion, ideology. And they're all in tension with each other. What is going to decide between them? If you have a clash between, as you always do, between politics and religion, economics and society, or even within them, what is going to sort out the tensions between them? And we believe that this is the role of law. Law is above all of them. We think of the law as the highest form of power, continuity, and institution in England. Or putting it in another way, these are like bits of a machine which are separated and they start to grind together. And the, and the law is like oil that comes down here between them and stops them grinding against each other too much. It acts as a, as a way of making them integrated but not clashing too much. <coughs> Therefore, the development of the legal system in England is really the key, and it is the most important part of our history, our legal system. And this was recognized by the founder of uh, economics, Adam Smith. He said there were three things that you needed for wealth and a modern economic system. Um, one was peace, that is, not having warfare. Another was a taxation system that was modern and effective. And the third was what he called a due administration of justice. It's not widely known that Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, also wrote, wrote that was only half of his great work. The other half was not published until only 20 or 30 years ago, when it was rediscovered in the form of notebooks of his people who went to his lectures. And the, that part is... Um, published as Lectures on Jurisprudence. Jur jurisprudence means law. So Adam Smith's other half of the Wealth of Nations is on law. He believed that the English legal system was the underpinning of modern democracy. This is another reason why if you try and take uh, the institution, say, of parliament and voting, and you put it in a lawless place like Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever, it won't work because it needs the underpinning of uh, complex, safe, and free law. Now, what is this law? Well, one feature of it is that it is an equal law. That is to say, there are no separations between people on the basis of their birth. I've talked about this in the lecture on uh, status and, and class, class and caste. People are born equal in England. We have not had slavery as a status in our country for a thousand years, and even serfs, as I mentioned, were kind of servants. Nobles and commoners, we don't have that. Everyone is equal of blood. Men and women are equal in birth. At birth. During marriage, there is an inequality where the man becomes maybe the guardian. This is historically. Parents and children are equal. There is no patriarchal power, as I mentioned before. So there is no permanent inequality built into the legal system. A person who goes into a court 
In most parts of the world, if you go into a court and you say, well, I'm this person's uncle, or I'm his father, or she's a woman, or she's my child, then the judge will immediately say, oh, well, you're superior, this person's inferior, we will support you against this inferior person. There is nothing of that in England. You cannot draw on your class, or I mean your uh, gender, or your um, kinship relationship to make you superior or inferior. It's often thought that this idea of equality before the law was invented perhaps by the Americans in their revolution or the French Revolution, but it's actually fully established in England 800 years ago. It's a shocking concept because most societies do believe in birth differences. So when it was introduced into Imperial India in the middle of the 19th century, many people thought it was, it was awful. Are you really going to treat women as equal to men? Are you really going to treat low-class people as equal to high-class people? Are you really going to say that children have the same rights as their parents? It undermines. It's a revolutionary idea. But it was brought in. Um, and nowadays, we just take it for granted in England. For instance, just to take a trivial example related to your question about our royal family, if Prince Charles, who's the heir to our throne, was caught speeding, i.e. driving his car too fast, or he was caught breaking into um, uh, a large uh, department store and stealing lots of chocolates, he would have to go to court and he would be tried by ordinary people in the same way as everyone else, even the Queen. Everyone is under the law. No one is an exception to that. Um, of course, in practice, although in theory everyone is born equal, you have advantages. If you are born into a rich family, a powerful family, an educated family, then you have some advantages. You can maybe hire employ better lawyers to defend you in certain cases, and so on. But in essence, in theory, you are a single individual who's tied up with individualism, with certain rights, whether you're a man, a woman, a child, an adult, and you go into the court as equal. And, in fact, even if you have money, it doesn't really protect you too much, because the legal system has been historically pretty um, fair and avoided a lot of corruption. For instance, um, and I'll come back to this later, if you have committed an offence, if you have, um, say, murdered someone or robbed someone, even if you're very rich in England, when you go into the court, you have 12 people, the jury, as we call it, the 12 people, they decide whether you're guilty or innocent. And those 12 people are chosen randomly, and the English tradition, which I gather may be different from uh, parts of China and so on, is that these people uh, will administer justice honorably and fairly and cannot be bribed or put under pressure. Sometimes there are attempts to do this, and they that occasionally succeed. But nearly always, these people will decide, and even if you're very rich, you can't go to these people and say, let my son off this particular case, I'll give you lots of money. That's very rare, very rare. Um, it's also particularly rare because, as uh, I'll explain, the cases are heard in public, so anyone can go and listen, and if they suspect that something strange is going on and justice is not being done, it will be seen by everyone. Now, this law is not only equal, it is uniform. It goes right across England. Everyone has the same, same legal system. And it is very early. It was established on the basis of Anglo-Saxon law, that is, over a thousand years ago. And the great lawmakers in England uh, were people like Henry II in the 12th, 13th century. So that by you remember Magna Carta was 1215. By 1272, 
when a lot of the great reforms in law were, had been made. Um, Maitland, who is, I'll be drawing on, and I've drawn on before, the great historian of English law, Maitland, says, if we look, could look at Western Europe in the year 1272, perhaps the characteristic of English law which would earn the most prominence would be its precocity. Precocity means early development, extraordinarily early development. By that date, he says, English law is modern, in its uniformity, it's everywhere, its simplicity, and its certainty. The greatest historian of English law said that by 1272, which is 800, nearly 800 years ago, or more than 800 years ago, uh, English law is modern. England <coughs> was an island of law, as one other commentator has put it. Um, it resisted other legal traditions. I mentioned the importance of being an island because what happened was that in, in Europe, here is England here, and this is continental Europe. All this area had quite a similar legal system up to about the 11th, 12th centuries. And then, Gradually, coming up from the universities in Italy, Padua and Bologna, and a revival of what, what was called Roman law, the, the late law of the Roman Empire, which was very um, absolutist. It wasn't democratic. It gave great power to the father, to the king, to the ruler, and of course the rulers loved it. You had this spreading out, what is known as the reception of Roman law, so this whole area became adopted a Roman law system. But it didn't come to England. England rejected it and maintained its old Anglo-Saxon and Norman legal systems. So gradually England became more and more different from continental law. Um, so Tocqueville says um, Aided by Roman law and by its interpreters, the kings of the 14th and 15th centuries, i.e. gradually over the centuries, succeeded in founding absolute monarchy, absolutism, on the ruins of the free institutions of the Middle Ages. The English alone refused to adopt it, and they alone have preserved their independence. And he's writing as a Frenchman who was trying to understand the difference of England. Now, what does this mean in practice? And I'll only have time to give you just one or two examples. One is the process in legal cases. In this whole Roman area, you have legal, legal processes which are fit with an absolute political system. And they are the ones which you'll find in almost every civilization. You'll find them in this area, but you also find them in Japan, China, India, and elsewhere. And basically, in such systems, you have a king up here, and you have the people down here. And you don't have anything between. You don't have civil society, and you have a legal system which says, if one of these people is suspected of having committed an offence. What you do is the whole weight of that political power from the centre drops down onto that person. Characteristically, say, in uh, 8th, 9th, 10th century China or 18th century France, the legal process was very simple. Someone had committed offence. You had a guess as to who it was. You had a, what was known as a prosecuting magistrate in France, um, the Mandarin in China. And this person would, would go out into the market saying there's an offence. Does anyone have any idea who did it? And someone would say, oh yes, I think it was so and so. Um, and the magistrate maybe heard from several people that it was probably so and so. 
So they go, they arrest that person, they bring them in, they beat them with canes. Um, they say, did you do this? And the person says no. And then they say, well, there's a lot of people who think you did. Uh, I want you to confess that you did this. I've got to sort this case out quickly. Um, and the person says, no, I didn't do it. And so they are tortured with vicious tortures until they accept it. This was the system you found in the Soviet Union. Um, <coughs> you find it in the great novel, Darkness at Noon, um, for instance, where you have to get a confession before you can punish someone. So you get the confessions by torture. And there is no protection for this person. They are presumed to be guilty, they are tortured, and then executed, or whatever it is. Now, that is the normal situation in human, and that is what the world would be like now, universally, if on one island they hadn't preserved a different legal system. Because in this legal system, the power relationship between the individual and the state is very different. You have the state, you have the individual, but between is the whole area of civil society and society in general. And here, what happens in a criminal case, say, 500 years ago, is that if someone is suspected by their neighbors or anyone else, you have to bring a formal case what is called an indictment. That is a piece of paper which says who did it, where they did it, when they did it, how they did it, why they did it, if possible. You present this piece of paper to a local gentleman <coughs> who is what we call a magistrate or a justice of the peace. And this is still the system in England. Sarah, my wife, is a magistrate and uh, practice this. This is just an ordinary person, not appointed, well, appointed by the legal profession, but not being paid. Uh, independent, educated, mind of their own, many rich friends, and so on and so on. And you have to take this, in the first case in England, you had to take it to a whole group of these people called the grand jury, which might be 10 or 15 of these people, and persuade them that there was sufficient evidence to proceed with this case. Nowadays, what you do is you take it to a magistrate's court where 97% of English trials start, even serious ones, and many of them end there. These are ordinary citizens, three of them sit together. The Crown says, we believe this individual may have committed this offence. These three judges sit. The state can't put any power on, uh, pressure on them. They listen to the evidence and then they either say, we think there is a case here, or they, we think there isn't a case here. If it's a serious case, they say, well, there is a case to answer, and then it goes to a higher court. And when it goes to a higher court, you have a very peculiar but enormously important institution, which is that you have the judge who is sitting there, just like an umpire in a tennis match, or um, in uh, any kind of competition. You have someone who is outside watching the, for fair play, like a referee or something. You then have the two individuals, or rather the state is here, the prosecutor for the state, and the accused is here. This is represented by a prosecuting attorney. The accused is represented freely, usually, by a defence lawyer, paid for by the state. And round here, along here, are sitting 12 ordinary citizens. These citizens, in the past, what you used to do was to get a list of 36 names. And you showed it to the accused person, and you said you were allowed to get rid of 12 
of the 36 names without telling us why. In other words, if you think any of them are against you or have any reason for being your enemy, you can just get rid of 12 of them. You can get rid of another 12, but you have to tell us why you're getting rid of them. So you are left with 12 who you are confident might give you a reasonable trial. You then have the argument between them. And finally, these 12 ordinary citizens decide whether you are guilty or not. At that point, the umpire, who has been watching for fair play, decides what the punishment should be. He doesn't decide whether you're guilty or not. Now this means, this is the great defence in England against absolute government, because if the state decides it has an enemy it wants to get rid of, it can't just <coughs> torture them and make them confess. It has to persuade 12 ordinary people who meet secretly, discuss among themselves, have to be convinced that this person is an enemy of the state. So many times in our history, the state has wanted to get rid of people or uh, punish them, but has been frustrated by the jury system. And nearly all our main trials are jury trials. In this trial, the assumption is that the individual is innocent until proven guilty. You start with the assumption. They're not allowed to be taken into court with um, handcuffs on, because that would imply that they are already guilty. So they have to come in as free people. They are free people, innocent, until the uh, prosecution can prove to these people that they are guilty. And it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. Not enough to say, well, perhaps or probably. It must be pretty certain. So it's like a, a game or a sports match. And it's a situation where torture is not allowed. It, torture has not been allowed in English law for 99% of English history. There was a short period in certain cases in the 16th century when torture was allowed. But torture is not allowed in, in English law. Um, and this is the criminal process. The other 90% of English law is concerned with property. Most of English law is property law because, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, uh, property is the heart of capitalism and it's the heart of English society. So nearly all our courts are concerned with property law. And there is, in these courts, a huge defence of individual private property. And this also is a defence for the citizen. Because if the Crown, for example, wants to build a, um, a railway line or an airport through your garden or town, then you can bring legal actions, you can protect yourself against the Crown. There is no right, no one has the right, and it's also the case with rich, powerful people who live about near you. If they try and threaten you in any way, either your property or your person, then you can bring legal actions against them, which people did very frequently. frequently. So, as I said at the beginning, law acts as a defense, a mediator, an oil between institutions. And it became particularly important as the British Empire expanded. It was the thing that held together the British Empire. Many people objected to being ruled by Britain, Pax Britannica, but they said there were two good things about being ruled by Britain. Many bad things, we get taxed, we get um, the insolence of the British who think of themselves as superior to us and so on. But there are two good things. One is peace. Not so many wars. Um, Pax Britannica. The other is a fair legal system, which means that we feel safer in ourselves. We can't, um, from the Middle Ages, for instance, we had a particular um, legal provision called habeas corpus, which means I have a body. And it means that um, traditionally over the centuries, if the king's um, officers, the police, come and seize you in the middle of the night and put you into prison, they can only hold you 
for a very short time before you're allowed <coughs> to make an appeal to an outfield lawyer to, they have to charge you with an offence. I haven't gone into the, um, violence, which is the other part of this in which I'll be dealing with in the uh, book, but the result of all this was that it, England had a very uh, peaceful and largely non-violent society. It was self police The English police were villagers. People were chosen from the village. They were the constables. In continental tradition, the police were the agents of the state. They were very violent, they were mounted, they had guns, they had come. The English um, were just a villager who was, for that moment, in charge of carrying out the law in that village. And the result of this was, it had many results. For example, England never had bandits. It never had groups of people who were fighting against the state. In, a, in China, very famously, I used to watch films about the water margin about the heroes who lived in the swamps on the edges of China. Or you would find bandits in Italy and so on. Bandit is an Italian word, which means outside the law, banditti. And it, the word was brought into England because even our most famous supposed bandit, Robin Hood of Sherwood Forest, uh, wasn't a bandit properly. In any way, he probably didn't exist. He was a myth, largely a myth. Uh, we didn't have mafia, we didn't have secret organizations in England, because people felt closer to and, and relaxed about the state. You didn't have to do organized things secretly. So a black economy, mafia, triads, yakuza, we don't have, we didn't have. And nor did we take justice into our own hands, so feuding, that is, groups of family or villages fighting each other, which is a very common feature of traditional peasant societies. Feud is a Scottish word, a mafia, Italian word, bandit, Italian. These are words which are brought into the English language because we didn't have them. So for the last thousand years, we haven't had these kinds of illegal activities. So to conclude, for our country to be really modern, it needs a certain kind of legal system, which again is only just a part of the jigsaw. You can't just set it up, but unless you think hard about how to do it and how it should work and how it should fit in with other things, the kind of modernity which we've uh, enjoyed in England and was exported to America and elsewhere is very difficult. It's both a causal factor in modernity, but it's also a reflection.